The 1963 march led by Dr. Martin Luther King and that I Have a Dream speech in Detroit commemorated two months ago along Woodward Avenue. Hundreds taking part. I hope that as you step out into the street this morning, you are making a commitment, a commitment to organize our community. This is a generational moment, and it's personal for me. My father marched 60 years ago as a six-year-old in this march. Organized labor and the civil rights movement are inextricably intertwined. You know, we stand together, and it is a great, great, prestigious honor to be a part of this. We see people banning books. People want to ban the book that talks about Dr. King. This march would not be acceptable in Florida under the current government, under the current legislation. You can never stop marching. You know, it's critically important, though, that we have fixed policy to protest. Mm. Protest without policy is pure performance. The fight now, the fight back then. 1963! Then it was the walk to freedom. Detroiters and Dr. King, historic. Some say the beginning of a change that was going to come. Why is it a little known fact that Dr. King rehearsed the I Have a Dream speech here in the I city know. of Detroit first before he took it to Right, DC? well you know how it is, man. You, you know, you're getting your, you're getting your sing on at one place before you go sing. You uh, working it out? Yes, yeah, right, you working out the kinks and stuff. And this ain't no small place, Detroit. If you can do it in Detroit, then you can withstand all kinds of critique because people here are rigorous about performance, <laughs> about intelligence, about oratory and the like. Charity, you were intentional with bringing your daughter here. Why? Absolutely. Um, well, she has to see this in action. And she also gets to see mom at work in a number of ways. She also needs to see mom marching down. And she, she needs to get the opportunity so that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, she'll be able to say she participated in the march as one of the first steps toward her own fight for freedom for all of us. This is commemorating the, the um, downtown Detroit downtown walk from Woodward to um, Cobo Hall in 1963. I was six years old when I was in the first march in 63. So you were in the original march in yes, 1963? Yes, my dad. My dad brought me. Memory 60 years on for Gregory Gunn and for Dorothy Dewberry Aldridge. It was a beautiful, beautiful day, and no one expected these many people to show out. An estimated 125,000. Aldridge was 20 years old in 1963. She's talking with one Detroit contributor, Bryce Huffman. You, you asked if there were a lot of white people there. It was well integrated. And then, you know, the, at the time, the mayor uh, of Detroit, uh, Mayor Kavanaugh, was a white person. So there was no conflict between blacks and whites uh, as such, no. One Detroit spoke to the late Reverend Dr. Joanne Watson just before this year's Detroit walk. It meant a lot because the injustice that was happening around the country was not just in the South, it also included the North. There were uh, housing issues, employment issues, issues just related to the quality of your life. In 1963, of course, there was the question about police harassment, police uh, brutality of the young people in Detroit. Now, one other thing I want to add, that Medgar Evers had just been killed in Jackson, Mississippi. Medgar Evers, an NAACP official assassinated by a white supremacist less than two weeks before. And it was a motivating force that caused people to come out to the march that may not have uh, had uh, had Evers not been, been killed only days before. That march was organized by the Detroit Council for Human Rights, which was led by Reverend C.L. Franklin. And of course, if you don't know C.L., you probably know his daughter, the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin. Reverend Albert Clegg, who will become the founder of the Shrine of the Black Madonna and change his name to Jeremoji Abebe Ajiman. Benjamin McFall, the owner of McFall Brothers Funeral Homes, and James Del Rio, who will go on to become a judge. Reverend Clegg and Reverend Franklin decided to start the Detroit Council for Human Rights with the idea that there really hadn't been enough improvement for African Americans since the 1943 race riot. And the march, the Walk to Freedom, was the first major event that the organization organized. The local NAACP? not in on the planning. Seemed to them these activists were pushing too hard, 
too fast. Some thought that Reverend Clegg was, was, was clearly more radical than the Detroit NAACP. Uh, and at times, so was Reverend Franklin. The NAACP did bring protest signs, but the United Auto Workers Union was a real driver of the march. There's no doubt that the walk to freedom could not have happened without the UAW uh, under the leadership of Walter Ruther. These are some really cool objects from the march. UAW archivist Gavin Strassel sits on a wealth of research material at the Walter P. Ruther Library at Wayne State University. The records really reflect that as figures like Martin Luther King start to make inroads in American society. You can see that the UAW takes notice and becomes a major financial contributor and supporter of the civil rights movement. Dr. King spoke before the union's membership two years before the march. The UAW's Lillian Hatcher was a Walk to Freedom organizer. I think having the UAW involved in the planning probably went a long way in letting Martin Luther King know that this is a legitimate event and that this is something that he wants to take part in. So Ruther and King had a great bond. In fact, there is some thought that King might have written some of the I Have a Dream speech at Solidarity House, UAW's headquarters in Detroit. So with the UAW and Reverend C.L. Franklin, there was Dr. King's other Detroit connection. Barry Gordy Jr., the founder of Motown Records, had met King, um, we know, several years before 1963, probably the late 1950s. And what came from that was Barry Gordy actually covering payroll for Dr. King um, to pay his staff. And my understanding is that that happened more than once. And so in, in so many ways, not only you know, was Motown organically helping the civil rights movement and, and being a catalyst for bringing people together, but also in a very intentional way, they were supporting the efforts of Dr. King. The Detroit speech at Cobo Hall preserved on record by Motown. Segregation is wrong because it is nothing but a new form of slavery covered up with certain niceties of complexity. <laughs> Dr. King would finish his speech in Detroit with the words perhaps he's most remembered. I have a dream, free at last. Words he'd take to Washington two months later. They came from Los Angeles and San Francisco. They came from Cleveland, from Chicago. And they came from Detroit. August 1963, the March on Washington. Detroiter Edith Lee Payne was there with her mother. She decided that we would go to Washington. She would always stress to me how important it was for me to be the best that I could always be. And I could achieve and be whatever I wanted to be. It helped me be more of an American, which is what I am. The fact that I'm a black American is secondary. That doesn't define me, and, and our colors should never define us. Dr. King didn't want our colors to define us. He wanted our character to define us and who we were as a person. And in Birmingham, Alabama, and all over the South and all over the nation, we are simply saying that we will no longer sell our birthright of freedom for the mess of segregated puppies. Historians have written and said often that had there not been those two marches, we may not have achieved the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act without those marches, which take place just before the passing of that landmark two pieces of legislation. Watch One Detroit, Thursday at 7.30 p.m. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter.